Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry, and you are listening to From the Dark Side podcast. This one is much less true crime and more sci-fi. I throw one of these in every once in a while. This is a short, interesting story about a man who was 32 years old who vanished back in 1980. He claimed he was going on a voyage into space. Now, normally we would just roll our eyes, but Granger was a genius and a master level mechanic. He spent countless hours a day building things out of junk. He was really good at what he did. Some clues have folks wondering if he really did what he said he was going to do. Did Granger really abandon all his earthly possessions and take off for space? My sources are listed in the description area, and this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This is episode 61, The Departing of Granger Taylor. The story takes us back to 1980, Some things going on at that time. John Lennon was shot and killed by Mark David Chapman. That happened only one week after this story took place. Mount St. Helens erupted and killed 57 people. Macaulay Culkin and Kim Kardashian were born. The average income was $19,000. The average price for a pound of bananas was 35 cents. The number one song was Call Me by Blondie, and the number one movie was Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. And lastly, there was the debut of the Rubik's Cube and also Post-it Notes. I literally use Post-it Notes 100 times a day at work, so thanks for that. This story takes place in Canada, specifically an area called Duncan, which is in southern Vancouver Island. Duncan currently has a population of only 5,000 people. Everyone knows one another. And back in the 70s, kids rode their bikes everywhere, and Duncan is considered a safe place to live. Granger Taylor was born on October 7th, 1948. Granger was different than a lot of kids his age. He suffered tragedy at an early age. When he was just a young boy, his father drowned in a lake near the family's cabin. At least that's what they think happened. They went to the lake and his father left in a boat and didn't return. Now, I don't know if his boat was ever found, but it's assumed that the boat capsized and he fell in. His mother ended up remarrying, and Granger had a lot of stepbrothers and sisters. He spent lots of time in his bedroom just dismantling toys and putting them back together. Granger ended up dropping out of school when he was only in the eighth grade. He was incredibly smart, though, and felt that he had learned enough to get by through the rest of his life. As a teenager, Granger was obsessed with building things and restoring things. He had worked as an apprentice for a mechanic for a while and felt he'd learned everything he needed to know. But his biggest projects were that he restored an old locomotive train and a World War II Kitty Hawk airplane. He was literally the best mechanic anyone knew. His parents' property was filled with mechanical equipment of all different kinds that Granger had worked on. A little more backstory on Granger, he wasn't like people his own age. He didn't fit in well with adults, so he mainly just hung out with teenagers. They helped him build things and scavenge for parts. He didn't have interest in girls and relationships and things other men his age were concerned with. Granger wasn't considered weird, though, or called crazy by anyone. Words used to describe Granger were genius, mechanic, prodigy, and brilliant. Now, just to rewind a bit, there was an instance in Duncan that took place in 1969, just 11 years or so before our story. So Granger is around 21 years old. It's New Year's Eve, 1969, and there are some nurses working on the geriatric unit of a hospital not far from Granger's house. It's about 5 o'clock a.m., and it's still dark out. Suddenly, a few of the nurses gather around a window and look outside and see what appears to be a UFO. It's hovering about three stories above the ground. One of the nurses points out that there is a human-looking pilot doing something with the gears and steering apparatus, except it, it looks more alien than human. 
Then another similar figure appears in the cockpit. Suddenly, the aircraft moves behind some trees trees, and then takes off quickly into the night super fast. They all look at each other like, what the hell did we just witness? It's found that others that morning in the area had called in the same exact report, that they had seen this same exact thing. So for the next few years, everyone in the area is obsessed with UFOs, Granger included. Granger had a best friend who was around half his age, a teenager named Robert Keller. Robert and Granger were very close, and Robert helped him work on things all the time. They also smoked a lot of pot together. Robert is just a teen, and like Granger did, Robert dropped out of middle school. His parents never minded him hanging out with Granger, though. In fact, they thought Robert could learn a lot from his older friend, like having a mentor around. Robert even helped Granger paint his truck pink, like bright pink color. (laughs) People in town thought it was hilarious. Granger restored an old World War II-era airplane and sold it to a collector. He was paid $20,000, which in 2023 money is $98,000. When Granger was in his early 20s, he did something amazing. He found this old steam locomotive just rusting in the forest. It had trees growing through it, and it was in really bad condition, almost hidden in the forestry. He brought it piece by piece back to his parents' property where he restored it and even built 300 feet of train tracks where he took local kids out for a short ride on it, like up the tracks and then backwards. It was like a local attraction. This train today is displayed at a museum. If you want to learn more about it, just Google Shawnigan Lake Lumber Company Locomotive Number 2. Then something happens in 1977, and that was the release of Star Wars in theaters. Granger and Robert go to the movies, and Granger then becomes even more obsessed with aliens and space. Granger decides he's going to build something he hadn't before, a full-blown spaceship. He wanted to make it basically a clubhouse for him and his friends. Again, even though Granger is around 30 years old, all of his friends are teenagers. Granger was well-liked by kids and parents alike. Many people came out to see Granger attempt to hover the airplane he restored, or they send their kids to Granger to teach them how to build things. So he and his friends scavenge around for parts and satellite dishes, and he builds this giant saucer-looking clubhouse. It took him almost a year, and they had lots of trips to the dump. It's equipped with a television and a couch. This is where he and Robert would sit and smoke weed for hours on end, to the point the whole thing would be filled with pot smoke. (laughs) Robert says Granger did well smoking pot. It made him more creative, like it does to a lot of people, except me. I've told you guys before, me and pot do not do well together. I'm glad it works for everyone else, though, including Granger. Granger spent a lot of time in this saucer and often spent nights in it. Granger confides in his friends something huge, something that most people would just laugh and change the subject. But with Granger being an honest man who was borderline genius, it's hard to not take what he says seriously. Granger and Robert are working on a plane, and he tells his friend that he's been communicating at night with extraterrestrials. He says he can't see them, but they are communicating via his thoughts. The aliens were talking to his mind. They discussed a lot of technical things about their ship and how it was powered. Granger says the aliens invited him to go on a trip through the solar system, but he didn't reveal details about it. For weeks and weeks, the aliens came back and talked to Granger telepathically. They said they needed his help. They would pick him up on a dark and stormy night, and he would be gone for 42 months traveling through space. The reason it had to be a stormy night was so that they could hide their ships better. Robert is only 15 and is intrigued by what Granger is saying. He asked Granger the name of the planet they were from. Granger tells him, but Robert quickly forgets. One thing is for sure, and that's that these communications were very vivid. Not like a dream, but a clear voice speaking to him and listening. They were full-blown conversations. Eventually, Granger tells his plans to others, and word quickly spreads. Everyone's kind of like, okay, have fun traveling through time with your alien friends. Bring me back something cool. Granger has two weeks to prepare for his 42-month journey. Two weeks come and go. 
And it's now November 29th, 1980. The day has finally come. It's also super cloudy. As Granger had said before, the night he leaves, it will be dark and stormy. Granger is like a child getting ready to go to Disneyland. He's so excited, but nervous. He is putting the finishing touches on all of his affairs before he's going to leave for space for three and a half years. I don't know what others were thinking at this time. Likely only Robert is the only one who believes him. Everyone else was just kind of going along with it. Granger begins his day and goes to visit Robert for a bit. Robert tells him, but it's not storming. And Granger says, we'll just wait until tonight. Granger goes back to his parents' house to leave them a note. Now, his mother wasn't home at the time. She was vacationing in Hawaii. She never got to take vacations, and he didn't want to contact her on vacation and ruin her trip. He left it on their bedroom door for when his dad got home from whatever he was out doing. The note read as follows. Dear mother and father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship as recurring dreams have assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe, then return. I am leaving behind all of my possessions as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. I think it's important to mention that I did say his mom and dad, and I had told you earlier that his dad had passed away, you know, drowning in a lake when Granger was just a little child. I'm referring to his mom and his stepdad. His dad, his stepdad was kind of like the dad figure in his life, and he just called him dad. So that's why I said mom and dad. Now, he did leave a separate letter, which was his will. He filled it out, but crossed out words like death and funeral and wrote departed instead. He tells his parents to take care of his dog, Lady, and leaves them instructions on what to do with his belongings. Then Granger heads over to a local diner called Bob's Grill, and he's a regular there. He walks in and everyone says hello. Granger was quiet and doesn't say much, just finishes his meal. The waitress thought it was odd that he only had on a zip-up sweater and not his winter coat. This is late November in Canada, and a huge storm is brewing. The storm ended up being one of the worst storms the town has ever seen. It's historic, just like Granger said it would be. Power lines are down. People's homes are damaged. There's flooding. It's just a mess of a storm, almost like a storm of the century for this area. This is a sad day for Robert. Granger goes back over to visit him one last time and say his goodbyes. The rain is starting to come down very heavy. Robert asks him if he can come along which is heart-wrenching. Robert's dad is sitting there and smiling and saying, yeah, go along with him. You're already not in school. Granger tells Robert that he already asked the extraterrestrials if Robert can come along, and they said no since this was a top-secret mission. Besides, Robert is only 15, and Granger doesn't want him to abandon his life here on Earth. He also explains something else, and this is what made me so sad. Granger says he will be gone for 42 months, but these are 42 months at the speed of light. He says when he returns, he will only be 42 months older, but here on earth, it will be around 150 years. He tells Robert when he returns, he will come visit him. Robert doesn't realize it until he's older, but Granger was referring to visiting his grave since it will be 150 years later on earth. Granger tells Robert to try to be happy for him. He's going to see and experience things that no other human has ever seen before. This is a historic moment. A huge storm has begun, and Granger gives Robert a hug, gets into his pink truck, and drives off into the storm. He hasn't been seen since that moment, and it's been 42 years. The next morning is November 30th, 1980. The people of the town are out surveying the damages from the storm and cleaning up their yards. Everyone is expecting Granger is going to turn up at any moment with the story that the aliens never showed up. But Granger is nowhere to be found. This is sinking into Robert that Granger is really gone. He calls his house and talks to Granger's sister, who tells him he's not here. His truck isn't here either. Do you know where he went? They decide to give it a few days to see if he shows back up, but he never does. And now panic is settling in on his loved ones. Where is Granger? They're expecting he's going to come popping out like, hey, the joke's over. You know, I can, I can come out now. Granger's mom returns home from her trip and is startled to hear the news that her son is missing. 
They phone the police and report him missing, and a huge search is conducted, and there's scent dogs and helicopter searches, and still no signs of Granger. It can't be hard to miss his hot pink truck, but it's nowhere to be found either, and this is getting weird. Robert goes to visit Granger's mother, and they sit at the table and talk, and his mother cries and tells him, Granger's not a liar. He wouldn't lie to us about this, you know? He will be coming home. Robert would go out at night and stare at the sky, hoping to catch a a glimpse of Granger smiling and waving to him from inside a spaceship, or even just a glimpse of something resembling a UFO, but the sights never come. He believes Granger is coming back, since Granger wasn't one to lie or make up stories, as his mother said. For the next three years, Granger's parents leave their door unlocked every night in case Granger comes home. And then finally, a date is coming, one that everyone has been looking forward to. The 42-month mark, which is June 29th, 1983. Robert is kind of pissed because the talk of the town is Granger is returning after 42 months, yet these were the same people who laughed at him when he said he was going on a space voyage. Someone asked Robert why he wasn't excited about the 42-month mark. He says how Granger already explained to him that 42 months in space is 150 years on Earth, so that date is meaningless. That day came and there's still no sign of him. Granger's stepbrother worked for the Canadian Coast Guard at the time. He sat out half the night on the deck on his patrol boat, watching the night sky for any sign of Granger and his alien spacecraft, but was, dis- but was disappointed when nothing appeared. It wouldn't be until March of 1986, this is around five and a half years after Granger disappeared, that a clue pops up that could possibly have to do with what happened to Granger that night. A local forest worker found what appeared to be a blast site not far from Granger's home. It looks like an artificial crater. Scattered in the area of the crater were what appeared to be rusted parts of a truck. The Canadian police show up and find a couple bones, including an arm bone, that was broken. They assume these bones belong to Granger. And you got to remember, DNA testing was in its very early stages, and they had no idea how to find out for sure. There were no other bones, though, no teeth, no skull, or anything else identifying. Just to skip ahead for a moment, the bones have never been tested for DNA because they are missing. And don't even get me started on conspiracy theories with that one. (laughs) There was a tree that stood above the scene and located in that tree were various truck parts and even a tire. There were parts just rusting way up in this tree. They also found a piece of a sweater. I don't know if this was the same sweater Granger put on that night. A waitress at Bob's Grill said he was wearing a sweater when he left. Remember, she said she was puzzled because he wasn't wearing a winter coat like everyone else. Granger stored dynamite in his truck to blow up tree stumps. Back in the 70s, using dynamite to dispose of tree stumps was a popular thing. Robert says Granger handled dynamite dynamite on countless occasions and knew how to handle these types of explosives. He's not careless enough to just go blowing himself up. Robert also said that truck parts found in the tree were listed on the report as being blue. If you remember, Granger and Robert had painted his truck pink. Robert clearly knows Granger's truck is pink. Not only did he help paint it himself, but he watched him drive away that night into the storm and it was a pink truck. It's unlikely Granger repainted his truck blue in the middle of a storm. Granger's shed where he stored his dynamite was missing a few, but not enough to blow up a truck. This would take a ton of dynamite. The police seem to think that this is exactly what happened to Granger. He blew himself up, perhaps while trying to fly his way into space. The police officially closed his missing persons case with the cause of death listed as undetermined. They also don't suspect any foul play and that Granger did this to himself. But it's undetermined since Granger wasn't suicidal. The coroner has to use a certain kind of scale in these things to decide if suicide was what happened. Granger didn't check any of those boxes. Like like the will he left, he made sure to cross out words like death and funeral. He also didn't appear to be sad or depressed. And remember, he was happy on that final day and was excited for what was to come. Now, the true crime side of me is dying to discuss other theories. 
Did Granger commit suicide by blowing himself up with dynamite? Did he need a cool story to give his young friend Robert so he fabricated this elaborate story that he's going to go fly around space with aliens? Granger was not known to be suicidal in any way. He also had no history of mental illness or depression. He was also not big on alcohol. Is there the possibility that it was suicide? Of course, but his fr best friend and his mother think this is in no way what could have happened. The sad part to me, and this is where I think the story is going, is that Granger was known to be using a lot of acid during this time. Remember, he was laying in his flying saucer club at night. Well, a lot of these times he was taking LSD, like almost daily. Is it possible that the aliens he was communicating with were actually the LSD talking? I've never done acid before, but I know it makes you hallucinate. But Granger wasn't seeing the extraterrestrials. He was only hearing them in his mind. I listened to a podcast a while back, and it was Joe Rogan and Post Malone, and they were discussing LSD. They said if you take enough of it, you can talk to aliens. Granger was obsessed with space. After all, it was the 70s, and there was Star Trek, Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. We had just gone to the moon. Everyone was kind of fixated on outer space and extraterrestrials. The sad part to me is that I truly believe Granger was believing that he was needed by these extraterrestrials. They wanted his expertise and for him to join them on their ship to work as a mechanic, when the whole time there was really nothing there. Is it possible Granger moved away and started a new, a new life somewhere else? Granger had a good bit of money and none of it was taken. Money would be something you would need to start over. As well, Granger didn't really have anything to run away from. He was not married or in a relationship. He had a good life. I find it so strange that his pink pickup truck was never found, nor any body. He was six, he was six foot three and 240 pounds. He's pretty hard to miss. Robert and Granger's mother stayed in touch for years. It seems they were the only ones who believed Granger was really picked up by aliens and he didn't blow himself up on purpose. They say Granger was all about safety and was extra cautious when it came to using dynamite. Robert, who was in his late 50s, early 60s, says today about Granger, his friend who disappeared 42 years ago, it was like losing a brother, a father. The thought of not having Granger around was killing me. Granger was my mentor. I am who I am because of that guy. Granger has never been seen since that night back in November 1980. If alive today, Granger would be 75 years old. I checked everywhere to see if the Flying Saucer Clubhouse was still on his parents' former property, but it seems like it's been taken down years ago when, they, when his parents passed away. I can't find much on it. Some of Granger's work, like the locomotive, is still in museums today in 2023. I don't want to give a rest in peace like I usually do since there's a possibility Granger is alive. Perhaps he really is up there and will one day return. There's a really cool program about Granger on Paramount+. Plus. It's part of the series Never Seen Again. There you can see interviews with his friend Robert Keller. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care, and much love to you all.